You know, it was very surreal at the time. It was... I think sometimes you live in a little bit of a bubble while it's happening. Hi everybody, I'm Carolyn Don Johnson and you're listening to Famous with JC Don Valeris. Carolyn Don Johnson, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. <laughs> we met um, at the Canadian Country Music Association Awards on the red carpet. And if, for those of you who don't know what the red carpet experience is like, it is chaos. There is media up and down the entire carpet. The artists are doing the best they can to hit all of the media. We were, I think, the last media outlet on the carpet that day. And I saw you at the very beginning and I said to my co-host, oh my gosh, Aww. that is Carolyn Don Johnson and I'm about to lose my mind. I hope she doesn't skip us. And you didn't. You were so lovely. And I just wanted the chance to sit down and have a more formal conversation with you. I've been such a fan for a long time. So Aww. glad to have this opportunity. Well, thank you because yeah. you were so lovely too. And you knew my stuff and my music and um, just there was something really easy about talking with you so thanks for having me right again. back at you for sure so of course we were in Canada because that's where you grew up so talk a little bit about your childhood in Alberta I imagine country music wasn't as popular maybe as it is now in Canada I would have to agree with that mm -hmm. I don't think I thought of country as a genre I mean I my parents listened to Don Williams and Johnny Cash Jim Reeves but we also had the radio station that um, played all kinds of music. So it was top 40. I remember sitting with my little alarm clock to the one speaker listening to Blondie and Fleetwood Mac. And so I, I listened to everything. But country music, I am from a rural place, so I grew up on a farm. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you listen to is country music, yeah. but I do remember going to square dances and learning how to do that. And my family with the neighbors would get together every few months and have this like sing song and we'd sit around. Most of us kids would run off most of the time, but mm -hmm. sometimes we'd sit and sing too. And we'd be singing things like old log cabin for sale and gosh, to I can't remember everything actually right now off the top of my head, but old songs all like written out and photocopied in these binders. So that was part of my life. And then you started singing in church. I did. My mom played piano, mm -hmm. so she played piano in the church. And I think I just kind of started picking it up and naturally was doing it. In fact, I know that that's what I was doing. And then we had the lady at our church, the pastor's wife, taught piano lessons. And so I started taking piano lessons. And she cared so much about us kids, um, Mrs. Thiessen, if you're out there. <laughs> and we paid like $5 a lesson. Wow. And we had this incredible teacher. And I loved music. I was still a kid who didn't like to practice all the time. Mm -hmm. But I started on piano and um, eventually played in band, flute, clarinet, alto tenor sax, some trumpet, and uh, that led to even you know more later, which was guitar, mandolin, things like that. Was there an artist back in those early days that you were kind of modeling yourself after or kind of studying their voice or the way that they wrote their music? When I think about really early days, no, I don't think there was. I think it was all kinds of music. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I heavily, my first album was ABBA, Voulez Vous, <laughs> the blue yeah. one, it was a cassette, and then my next album was Arrhythmics, believe it or not, then after that, I believe it was Amy Grant, and I remember at some point bringing like a Kiss cassette home from, from um, my friends, and my mom made me give it right back, she did not want me to be listening to that, Really, and um, that was kind of funny, and... I listened to, I already had the country music in the house and gospel music, so I was getting the things that I wasn't able to get at home from other places, and I, it's funny as I'm saying this out loud, I've never really said that, but when I think about it, that's kind of what it was, and I just, I couldn't not listen to music. I was already doing, I joke around about multi-track recording, I would take my little cassette recorder you know, the kind that had the little buttons oh, and yeah. one speaker and you pushed it and the cassette opened up and you could carry it around and I would put it by the piano, I would write these songs 
at a very early age and play the song and sing the harmony part in the chorus and then take that into my room and sing to myself, <gasps> sing the lead. When I, I didn't know that that was anything back then, but I was already kind of like in, in that mode. And I, my brothers used to go crazy because I would rewind things over and over. Listen to that guitar part. Did you hear that? You know, um, so it fascinated me and I was enthralled by music my whole life. I think it's interesting because the music that you ended up writing has that catchy pop feeling, even though it's country music rooted. It's interesting because it obviously stems from those early influences that you had. I think it does. And a lot of my harmony vocals, like I have the linear stuff that's like this, mm -hmm. where you're singing right with the lead, and then I have counter things and I do all this stuff. I do think that that was influenced by people like Fleetwood Mac and ABBA yeah. that had all these different kinds of vocals going on because I love picking those parts out. I loved singing them. And uh, they ended up landing in my demos, which ended up landing in my records. And um, yeah, there's all kinds of influences there. When you got into high school, I know, like you said, you picked up some other instruments and continued doing music. But I read, and you can tell me if this is true, that you weren't necessarily met with encouragement from people in high school, maybe some of your teachers. Is that correct? They, um, I actually had a band teacher that, I don't know why, it was almost like he picked on me. I'm not sure why, but uh, I ended up quitting band because of him. I can't believe it. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to say his name, but you know, these kinds of things happen. I don't re remember everything that led to that, but I did really gravitate towards country music in mm -hmm. high school. I mean, I was absolutely listening to everything that was going on. And Randy Travis, I like worshipped Randy Travis, still do. Um, and all of the girls like Carleen Carter and Pam Tillis and Mary Chapin Carpenter. And, and moving into that, I remember going to a George Strait concert in Edmonton and how we won a one opening and just being like wow and everybody was two-stepping around the the main floor of the coliseum and i loved that music so much and i didn't know how i was ever going to get into it because i i i wanted to but it seemed so far-fetched that um I'm not sure if I necessarily believed at that moment in time that that was my journey mm -hmm. or that was that was what I was really going to do. It was sitting here always bugging me. And then after I graduated from high school, like I did basically what was logical. And for me, it seemed like logical. It's like, oh, I guess I go to college and I've got good grades. I was a, you know, honor student. And so I went into, I had other interests, but I went into the academic route thinking, well, that will get me a normal, I don't know if normal is the right word, but job that will make sense yep. and I know that I can make money and I can land somewhere. And it wasn't until after a couple years that I called my parents and I said, I am going to take a year off and I need to figure this out because I don't think I'm <laughs> doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I feel like I'm spinning my wheels and wasting money. Yeah. And, and they said, go ahead and do that, you know. And I was paying for my own college anyway with student loans and every, I was working all the time. And, and that's where I decided during that time that, why not me? <laughs> why not me? I need to go and uh, try and figure this out. And that's when I pivoted completely. How lucky were to have parents that said, go give this a try. Yes because I think a lot of people don't have that opportunity. If you were asked by someone who was in, in high school or college at this point, um, and they were having a similar problem, you know, my teachers aren't really encouraging me to do this, but I know deep in my heart it's something I wanna do, what would the advice be that you would give to them? My advice definitely would be, if something is tugging at your heart, there's a reason why it is. Go in the direction of that. Go in the direction of your dreams, even if it seems crazy. I, I, every time I make another crazy move, it brings me somewhere that actually fills my heart with joy and I still make a living and I still keep doing it and I'm doing the things that I love and 
And I, I can't believe all the things that have happened to me in my career. Mm -hmm. I always call them bonuses to my dream because the dream I had was smaller than what the world had for me. Yeah. You know, what God had for me. It was like, oh my goodness, you know what? Keep dreaming and I'm going to give you some things. Yeah. Well, all of those dreams brought you to Nashville. Do you remember your first trip to Nashville? Yes, I do. It was in March of 94 and I had won, or I don't exactly know what you call it, I guess it's won, this scholarship by the Nashville Songwriters Association to go to this songwriting camp. So I had gone to this concert in the Vancouver area mm -hmm. with some songwriters, and I remember it was Pat Alger, Costas, I don't remember everybody, Joe Colucci, I feel like I'm missing someone. And they talked about the Nashville Songwriters Association. So I immediately joined and I started getting mail from Nashville quarterly from the NSAI and felt very important that I was getting <laughs> mail from Nashville. And at some point they were talking about this songwriting workshop. And I had been writing for years and I entered it and I sent in two songs. And in my mind, I saw them calling me and they did. And they called me and said that I basically got a scholarship which meant I didn't have to pay for the workshop oh my the gosh. weekend and I just had to get here so I got down here and did that and did a lot of tourist things I wasn't really able to rent a car but somehow we figured it out I was too young rented a budget or a rent a wreck which actually broke down on me no <laughs> yes after a couple days <laughs> Um, hilarious. I've got so many stories, but that was my first trip and I was soaking it in as a fan. I went and did the workshop, was blown away. James Dean Hicks was there too. And you had to play your songs for everybody. You had to play your songs for everybody and then they critiqued them and gave you advice. They also talked about their stories and we, we did like collage workshops and I can't remember everything we did, but it was expanding my brain because I was like, okay, I've been looking at all these people who wrote these songs, and this is what they do. I've been doing it out of inspiration and, you know, just kind of had to do it. It was part of my life. I play for my friends. I did little concerts here and there. And when I really realized how professional these people were, and how they treated it, like a job, because it is, mm -hmm. um, then, I, then I was all in. It was like, absolutely, I'm doing this. i got to figure this out. And when I got on the plane to go home, I was so distraught. I called my mom. I was crying. And I said, Mom, these people think like me. This is where I belong. I, I need to come back. i got to move here. And she said, okay, we'll get home. We'll figure it out. And I got on that plane, Rodney Crowell was in first class. I just saw him about a month ago and went up and talked to him about, about this. But anyway, I saw him, I was a fan of his, and I was sitting in my seat talking about to this person beside me. I said, I, I want to let him know I'm a big fan, and but I don't want to bother him, and I don't know what the right thing, and they're like, no, don't bother him, don't bother him. Well, we're about to land in Dallas, and I was going to be connecting to Canada, and I know he's probably not going to Canada, and I'm like, I got to do something. And so I wrote a letter and I gave it to the flight attendant and it just said, I don't need to meet you or anything, but you've inspired me. Um, I'm a songwriter. This was my first trip to Nashville. I'm coming back. Here's my card. Please remember my name. Thank you for all that you've done in the musical world. And the next thing I know, he's walking down <laughs> the aisle of the plane and I'm like, why, why is Rodney Crowell walking down the aisle? And he walks down, and there happened to be an open seat across the aisle from me, and he sat there and talked to me for about 10 minutes until they said oh. it's time to, you know, go down. And he was so encouraging, and he said, I will remember you. Um, he held the card and just was amazing. And, uh, yeah, I went home, and from then on it was like save, 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 mm -hmm. work, work, work. Right, right, right. How do I get back down there? And then I made a few more trips before I actually ended up making the move. Oh my gosh, what an inspiring story. And how <laughs> cool that, I mean, people in country music are generally so kind, you know, and they will 
they will take the minute to talk to you or offer advice or something like that. I'm so glad that was your experience with him. Yeah, he was great. That's fantastic. You finally moved to town. What was the moment that kind of opened everything up for you as far as your publishing deal? Was that a meeting that you had? Like, how did that happen? My publishing deal, I got after months and months of courting, you could say. And I had my sights on a little publishing company. It was an independent, Pat Higdon, because there were some great writers there. There was eight writers there, and my idol, Matresa Berg, rode there. And I was like, I want to be there. I ended up getting offers from other publishing companies, and I was in the middle of doing a deal with the amazing company, EMI. We were almost finished doing it because Pat was not signing me. And right near the end of that deal with lawyers and all that stuff, um, he, I was consistently writing with some of his writers. Mm -hmm. He let me do that. And so I was hanging around the publishing company, and he said, so have you signed that deal with EMI yet? And I said, no, I haven't. And I said, we're just about done. I'm so excited, you know. Finally, I'll, you know, get to stop waitressing and whatever, <laughs> you know. And um, he said can you get your lawyer to call me? And I was like, you're not going to sign me now, are you? Like, what are, What do you mean? Like, why? Why do you want my lawyer to call you? He's like, just get, just get her to call me. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And I remember when he made the deal offer to sign me, I already was growing a relationship with EMI and the pluggers and the people who, who believed in me there. And it was a big company, and it would have been great to be there, too. But in my heart, I really wanted to be at Patrick Joseph Music. And so I remember weighing out, I, I have it somewhere, I know I saved it, pros and cons of being with EMI and Patrick Joseph and weighed it out. And I couldn't sleep because I did not want to bail on this company. Bailing on, it, on them is not really the right way to say it, but I didn't want to pull out mm -hmm. when they we were already like spending money and doing this deal and everything and of course eventually I made the choice that felt right in my heart and ended up going with them and uh, got numerous cuts over the years now they knew that my goal was if lightning struck and I could get a record deal somewhere down the road that that was part of it but I also really wanted to make a name for myself as a writer first which is what Matresa did and I was following in her footsteps, and uh, that ended up happening. And thankful to them, that was a pivotal moment. But there was a moment prior to that where I used to go and sing with friends like Big Kenny and McKinley's and David Vincent Williams. I'm, there was a whole pack of us. Mm -hmm. We would hang out at night, get up and sing, and David Vincent Williams had a band and one night, I got off waitressing, and, you know, I had food on my shirt and everything, and he said, you need to get up and sing tonight because there's somebody here who can help you. And I said, uh, why can I, can I do it another time? Like, I just don't look the part right now. He's like, no, you look fine. Get up there. you got to get up and sing. So I went up and sang, and after that, I had a meeting with this man. His name's Scott Simon. And he said, come and see me in my office and um, I don't know exactly what I can do for you right now, but let's just get together. And we got together, and he said, this town takes a while. I'm not talking days or months. I'm talking probably years, but just know I have your back. Wow. And having his credibility behind me helped me keep moving forward and having, hey, there's this person that believes in me and this person. There was a few people that slowly started becoming part of my yeah, we know Carolyn Don Johnson, you know. And the way this town really works, and I've tried to encourage all the other up-and-comers, whenever I meet them, I'm, I'm like trying to impart as much wisdom as possible. But I'm like, make friends in this town. Mm -hmm. Get to know people. Be a good person. Be seen. You know, um, it's like, act like you've got time, but run with the wind, you know, fiercely to, to make your dreams come true. And... Um, I had a lot of good people eventually like come around me and that lifted me and got me ready for the time when Arista was like, so what's the thing with Carolyn? Mm -hmm. Let's sign her. You know, I didn't do a showcase. I didn't do any of that. It was like everything exponentially grew over time. Yeah. With singing demos, 
writing songs, doing things in the business. I kind of was everywhere. And I think the moral of that story too is you really stay true to yourself. You know, you remained a good person and true to the values that you came to this town with, which I think is so important because that doesn't happen for everybody. A lot of people get here, they see how the town works, they kind of change who they are to fit into the mold, but you didn't. You right. remained true to what was important to you. I do believe that I did and was able to and still am able to do that. By the time I got signed at Arista, they had three full CDs of my songs. I had no idea they were keeping track of me. Wow. And they and when it was like, I knew the a &R staff over there, but it, it's like they had disc one, disc two, disc three, and then they had this disc that was, I still have them somewhere, um, that had the songs that had been recorded by other artists by me. And so they... They saw who I was, they saw what I was writing, they listened to it, and by the time I got in there, one of the very, very monumental things that I remember my president, Tim Dubois, saying to me, I went into his office after we were about halfway through the record already, making it, we were having one last session of recording, and I walked by his office and I stopped back and I said, you know, you haven't told me what I have to record on this record. You've like given me such free reign and I thank you so much, but is there anything that you need me to do? Any songs in particular? And he said, there was three songs that I really knew we had to have on this record and you've already cut two of them and I know you're cutting the third on this next session, so do whatever you want. Wow. That doesn't always happen. No, it does not. And I'm like, oh my goodness, these people <laughs> see my heart and my artistry. They know who I am. <laughs> well, it's a testament to your artistry. <laughs> Having a label back you in that way, like I said, that doesn't that doesn't often happen. I want to talk about some of the hits that you've written for other people. Shelly Wright, Single White Female. Do you remember the moment you found out that, because that was your first number one. That was. Do you remember where you were, what was going on when you found out? I absolutely do. I was working for Martina McBride at the time, mm -hmm. and I was in the middle of making a record. So many things were kind of like just, you know, moving around, moving and shaking. And it was a Monday morning. We were in San Diego singing at, gosh, I can't remember. I think it's called Humphreys, um, this place. And... I was singing backgrounds and playing guitar for Martina while I was prepping to launch my own career. And in the morning, it's two hours earlier there, mm -hmm. when I opened my cell phone and turned it on, there was like 37 messages. And I was like, we went number one. <laughs> I still get chills. Oh my gosh. I was like, oh my goodness. And Shelly was on there and she's like, we did it. And oh, I, I just, you know, because I remember... I don't remember exactly who was in front of us. If I looked at one of my charts that are around here, I would know right now off the top of my head. I can't tell you who it was, but we were sitting there for a while before we actually got to number one. Well, and I that, that was a competitive time in country music. There were very so much. many artists and really, really big artists, too. Yes. And this was Shelly's first big, big song. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my goodness, sharing that with her was so wonderful and my co-writer, Shay Smith. So we had a great number one party, and there's a line in the song, to put it in a nutshell, which I had gotten from this book, this self-motivating kind of book called, in, it's called Being Happy. It's I've given it to so many people, but it's a short read that has two or three uh, pages of information, and then at the very end, there's this little cartoon with this guy, and it says, in a nutshell, and then it summarizes that that little bit. And so, when we were writing that song, we put that line in there to put it in a nutshell, like to summarize what we want yep. in, in a man um, or whatever you are looking for. That's what happened. And so I remember we had this, somebody found this big peanut and brought it to that's awesome. <laughs> the number one party. And it was uh, so good. But what a beautiful time that was. Yeah. I know you wrote Downtime for Jody Messina. Yes. What do you remember about writing that song? So I didn't remember some of the things that I'm remembering now. My co-writer was just talking about this because we did a writer's night together. But he had said to me, if you ever get canceled on, call me. And this particular morning I got canceled on and I called him and he came in. And I had that title sitting around and for some reason I threw it out there that day. And we wrote that song. We loved it. 
it ended up being on hold for this other girl on Lyric Street Records, Courtney, who's a friend of mine, um, for a long time. Actually, Jody put it on hold. It came off hold. Then it went to Courtney, and she had it for about a year. And right before she went in to record, it dropped off. And I was devastated because it had been sitting for so long. Well, shortly after that, um, really shortly after that, my publishers were very smart, and they said, you know what, Jody's going back in too. We're going to go back to her and pitch it again to her. They went in, she took it, she cut it. And then Courtney actually came back and said, you know what, we've decided we do want to do that song again. And I was like, oh my goodness, Jody just cut it. And I was so pumped. I was like, yay, Jody Messina cut it. And later on, another fun story about that is I was at the Opry with Martina and Jody was there. And I had never met her. And I kept seeing her backstage and I'm thinking, I need to talk to her. She cut one of my songs. And I kept putting it off, putting it off. It was never the right time. And then I saw her about to leave with her people. And I was like, I, I just got to go up and say hi. I was like, uh, Jody, Jody. <laughs> and she's like, yeah. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know if it's true that you cut one of my songs, but I think you cut one of my songs. I know it can sometimes maybe happen and not happen. <laughs> but it, she's like, which one is it? And I'm like, downtime. She's like, oh my goodness, yeah, we were just working on backgrounds today. I love that song. We're probably, it might be the title of the album, and I'm going to do a picture of me hanging upside down on a clock, which she didn't do that stuff, but it was awesome. And she took me into her car, and we listened to it. And um, after that, we've been friends ever since, and uh, she did such an amazing job of that. Around this time, you were writing for other artists. You were also writing for yourself. How were you deciding what to pitch and what to keep for yourself? That's very, very hard. Um, I definitely knew certain songs had to be mine. Mm -hmm. I remember playing Complicated at the Bluebird Cafe, and a lot of people came up to me. There was some A&R people in there, and they asked for if they could hold it. And I said, that one's actually not up for grabs. I'm holding that. And I didn't have a record deal yet. Wow. But I knew... Something about that was absolutely me. And I don't even know if I was thinking, this is me. I was just like, no, this one can't go. And another one of those was, I don't want you to go. I loved that song so much. It was so fun. It's still fun to sing. And somehow it got pitched out from under me. And the next thing I knew, I got a call from my publisher saying, it's already gone through all the ranks. Uh, everybody's heard it. Mindy McCready is cutting this. I'm like, what? How did this happen? That is one of like three songs that I did not want to go anywhere. And he said, the best thing to do in this town is to let it go. Mm -hmm. you, you're always writing great songs. Don't worry about it. It killed me. I don't know who initiated that, but because um, I still don't know. It could have been my my co-writer's publisher, it could have been somebody who, heard, it could have been my publisher, I don't yeah. know. Somehow somebody heard it and it went through all the channels and to get a cut, period, on someone else's record, I mean, I know how hard it is to even get one on mine because I write all my stuff, so even my co-writers, it's like, well, which things mean the most to me? Yeah. But when you're an outside writer on someone's project, it is very, very um, honoring that they take your stuff and put on there to represent them. And it's hard to get through all the channels, so I let it go. And eventually I sang backgrounds on it and supported it. And by the time I went to make my record, they didn't ever do anything with it. Really? And I got it back! Awesome. <laughs> it's probably my favorite song of yours. Thank you! I absolutely love it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love it too. I'm still not sick of it. Oh my god, I used to listen to that song in my headphones when I was probably like, I had just graduated high school and I was listening to, I just absolutely, that song is fantastic. Thank From you. beginning to end, it's a perfect song. Thank you. Love it. <laughs> so eventually you land your deal at Arista yes. and you get to record it. And you yes. record That Simple Life complicated Georgia all these amazing Thank songs you. they earn you a lot of awards Thank you. <laughs> what um what was your most memorable moment do you think from that time in your career once you started seeing this success for yourself I mean it's one thing to have it with another artist but to know that you've written songs that the fan base is responding to and you're you're getting to experience that you know it was very surreal at the time it was 
I think sometimes you live in a little bit of a bubble while it's happening. You don't really realize just how much until you're out in front and you see like this group of 10 girls that have all your songs on each one of their t-shirts and then you see these people have signs up and everything and you go, wow, how do these people, what, what is going on here? And it's, it's so powerful. And one of the biggest moments in my life, in my career, and it's hard to talk about and all, you'll get why in a second here. I haven't really talked about this in interviews. But my first really big year, um, I had the most nominations at the Canadian Country Music Awards. Now that's my home country and I had some nominations here, but it was a giant year. Ended up um, uh, taking home five awards that night. And it was such a beautiful night. And the next morning we woke up to September 11th. Mm. And, you know, obviously devastating for everyone in the world. And it was so shocking. And I just remember walking around and people not sure if they should say anything. And I didn't want to talk about me. I wanted to just, we were all sitting in this pain. And it got brushed under the rug immediately. And I never talked about it for years. Wow. That, that night still sits yeah, here. Yeah. Because it was so beautiful. <clears throat> and then it, it went away. Understandably so. Mm -hmm. That was way more important than a Carolyn Don Johnson career and a big night. Which is how we all felt and how I definitely felt. I was like, this is nothing. I'm alive. Mm -hmm. My family's alive. The people I work with are. And it was such a crazy time. So it was an amazing night that um, ended the next morning. But we still had an amazing night. It was a great year. Wow. I don't even know how to follow that I up. I know. Right I'm now. sorry that I brought that up. <laughs> no, I can't. no it's, a, it's an important story because I think, you know, artists especially can get caught up in those things. Being in magazines, winning awards, all of those things. But at the end of the day, the thing that's the most real is the people that we love and care about, the people in our family, our friends, and all of that. And even winning awards like that, yes, of course, they mean something. They do. But that can be taken away in a moment. So after that rise to success, you were a famous person. Do you remember the first time that you uh, realized that? Like, were you I, out in public? or I think I probably realized it in airports. Yeah. Because I, as we're talking about this right now, when I think about realizing oh my gosh people know my music they know who I am it's like I could be on a plane and someone grab me and go look what's in my CD player right now and I'd be like wow like right now room of the view is in there you know yeah. and so that happened to me a lot people mm -hmm. at baggage claim want to get pictures things like that and so when you think about I think the airport was one of those places that everybody's coming from somewhere and yeah. going somewhere. You don't know where anybody is from. And somehow you're in the same spot and they're actually, they know who you are. So that probably was the big thing um, because it was something that I knew if I would have seen someone that I loved and listened to in an airport, it's because I knew who they were and mm -hmm. I was listening and they were the famous person, you know? So... I think that's it. Has there ever been a moment in your life when you wished you weren't famous? There actually were a few times, yes. And some of that, I'm, I have, I feel like I'm a pretty kind person to everyone, but there was some people who overstepped mm -hmm. and that made me sad because then I just didn't, I just wanted to retreat. Yeah. And not going into any of that, but it, it did make me feel violated, and, and then I didn't want that, mm -hmm. you know? And so I had to fight against those feelings because being famous was never really what I thought about. It was more like, I want to make music for a living, and the more people I reach, yes, okay, oh, wait. If I reach a lot of people, that means I'm going to be famous okay, let's take a deep breath. Like, I can't imagine being like someone 
like Taylor take yeah. lessons, you know, like I, I think you have to really be built for that. And then you can bring that along with you and, and go to those places, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, I, I certainly love the attention about yeah. my music. Absolutely. And I love to play for people that does not get old. And when people sing back to me, I want to cry almost every single time. I'm like, this is amazing. One of the things that I think is so cool about you is you've continued to work with so many other artists, even after your own success. I mean, you still go out with Martina. So you've, you've played guitar with her, you've sung background vocals for her, and then you also are opening shows for her and stuff like that. What is it about being that side person for somebody like Martina? What does that fulfill in you? Good question. I think, first of all, I love her and I love her music, and she was definitely someone who was... She's a mentor still to me. I ask her for advice on so many things, but like a hero, and I love playing the music with her. Sometimes it's very relaxing for me to be on the side and just support someone else. Like it feels good to like weave in and out and, and uplift that situation. And um, I don't know, I love singing harmony, but I also love singing harmony with great people and great artists. So, uh, I'm not going to go out with just anybody, but Martina and I have a long-standing relationship. And until she kicks me out, <laughs> please don't do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, sing with her as long as I can. I've come in and out of that organization for about 25 years. Well, what a fantastic vocalist too to be able to do that with. You know, yes. it just must be such a uh, like an electric feeling when you, your voice is mixed together in a live situation like that. It's so wonderful, and she has taught me a lot. Back when we first got together was because she was produced by Paul Worley as well as me and I had gotten my record deal and you know I do all these backgrounds and fun things and he knew what I did on my demos and he called me one day and said hey do you want to come sing on a Martina record and I was like what <laughs> um yes so I went in there and I sang on the song I love you and saw that really high stuff I'm being so totally wrapped up and she came in about halfway through and she pushed the talk back button and said, hey, you want to come out on the road with me? And Paul said, I already told her, you know, starting your record and she's too late and whatever. And I was like, wait, but I really <laughs> want to. I do. <laughs> and so we had a great day. And then a couple weeks later, Paul called and said, you know, Martina's actually serious about bringing you out with her. So just give her a call and see what she's thinking. So I called her. And she said, I know you're about to do your own thing, but making records takes a long time. And if you want to come out with us, you know, we don't have a girl out there. And um, I can show you what I know and you can see what it's like to be on the road and and whatever. And um, I was like, let me ask Arista and see. And everybody was like, yeah, oh my gosh, that's like amazing. And I went out there and I was in heaven. I was in heaven. Mm -hmm. And I still am. You know, she's got a long-standing organization of people that have worked with her for years, me being one of them. So it's like family. Like, yeah. I feel like I'm going home when I get on that bus and go on stage with her. You know, one of my very first concerts that I went to was a girls' night out tour with you and Reba, <sighs> Sarah Evans, Jamie O'Neill, and Martina. What I have to just, from a personal standpoint, I have to ask you, what was that experience like being out with those women? <sighs> well, that was another one of those monumental times in my life. So, um... When I went out there, before we started the tour, Reba had decided that we were going to do an encore with all of us singing together. And I remember us standing around this grand piano and Reba like, and Martina kind of figuring out who's going to do what line of this and that. And I, I looked around me and I was like, what is going on <laughs> with my life right now? Like, it was... I could not believe it. And I, I wrote a song quickly after. It wasn't very good, but I had to write it. It was called Perma Smile. Because when I went out on that tour, that's all I did. I had the best time of my life. That, that was, I, you know, so many people say, you guys got to do that Girls Night Out tour again. Do that. Yes. And, you know, there's been different configurations of this and that. But, boy, it would sure be nice to do that. And I, I got ten minutes to sing and it was the best 10 minutes of my life on that tour 
Oh my gosh, you guys would be on stage for five hours with the hits between all of you <laughs> if you were to all go out now. That's fantastic. Yes. It's so nice to know that, you know, behind the scenes, what's really going on in the com camaraderie between especially the women in country music. It was all good. And that goes from the top down, right? So Reba yeah. was at the top, and Reba's amazing. And she she's just quality human being, and, and it spread all over, and that tour was six weeks straight, and uh, I had the best time. Amazing. I want to talk about your new music because you have been working so hard and so long on all of this. Yes. Your first single, Roadblocks. Amazing. Thank you. Talk about the inspiration <laughs> behind that song and why now? Why did you decide to record it and release it now? So Roadblocks was written several years ago. I don't remember what year it was written, but it was... Um, the title really told us what it was going to be about, you know. We, we wanted to relate it to life in general, not just like roadblocks in the road, but use that literal sense of it to talk about roadblocks in your life and, and for it to be an inspirational song. And I love writing those kinds of songs, yeah. so I like to break your heart and then I also like try to lift you up and like <laughs> give you wings. <laughs> so um, this song was what I wanted to put out first for this record because I've had a lot a lot of amazing things and I've had a lot of roadblocks in my life mm. and it felt like I needed to <laughs> nobody else out there really cares about this but for me I needed to go hey I know I've been kind of not out front for a while had a bunch of stuff I don't really want to talk about all of it but there's um, been a lot of roadblocks in my life and but guess what I'm kicking through them and I'm hoping you're gonna kick through them once you listen to this song and that's going to lead me into the rest of the record. Your social media campaign behind this has been awesome. You've Thank had you. so many people sharing their stories, personal experiences they've had, building up other women. Yes. Was that your idea? That was my idea. Amazing. I had this vision for a while with that song. And I just remember I kept talking to some of the people that I work with about it. And I felt like nobody was really grabbing onto it. And I was like, I really want to do this. I really want to do this. And um, once I started gathering the content, I guess you could say, and asking my friends, I didn't know how it was going to turn out necessarily, but at the CC Mazes when I first started filming stuff, I was like, I know the song's coming, and I just was grabbing as many friends as possible. I'm like, have you ever had any roadblocks mm -hmm. in your life? And if so, how did you get through them? That was, that was all I asked. And I let people say what they wanted to say. And everybody had something different. And it inspired me. It was like, wow, I've had mine. I know I've had to kick through some of them for sure. Some of them, you know, sit there for a long time. But they redirect you. And uh, I, every time I get a new story in, and I actually still have, like, another run that I'm going to be doing. By the time this airs, it'll have already done been done. But I got some more great stories that have come in and... Um, I'm going to have a, like a marathon weekend of just finishing some of them out. But ultimately, I think I've had about 80 stories. <laughs> wow. 80 stories. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Well, it just goes to show you're still writing music that connects so deeply because we've all had these same experiences. Yes. And you write in such an honest way. I know your latest single, Stubborn Clock, is a very honest song. And I know you've honest. said that it's one of your most personal yes. uh, things that you've written? Stubborn Clock is very personal because it talks about the clock continuing to tick. Mm -hmm. And I have a passion in my heart and a dream in my heart that I've, um, that has taken me on this great journey. And it's still there. And the clock keeps ticking. And it's like, well, do you make friends with it or not? Yeah. Because um, it is what it is. So you just keep moving forward. And there's a line in there at the end of the course that I love so much. Um, and it just says, maybe we shouldn't be enemies because time, you're just like me. We don't stop for anything. And I would hope that that would encourage other people to know and, and look inside themselves. It's like, don't let, it's, it's kind of like roadblocks, but it's different. It's like, don't let that dictate what you can or cannot do. Keep moving forward. Wow. Can we expect new music from you? Yes. Can you talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> I can. So, um, yeah, this is, 
I think it's a pretty powerful record. Yeah. There's there's some lightness in it, but there's a lot of deep subjects. And I think you can only have them if you've lived a lot. Yeah. So if people have followed me for years, they've probably gone through some of my things too. And um, But it's not all about me. But the title of the album is called There She Is. And this is one of the new songs on it because... After I went through a whole bunch of roadblocks, and you know, you, you still keep going through some, but I was sitting with a friend of mine, Brian Mayer, who I've written with for years, and we were talking, and I said, you know what, I, I felt like I wasn't even sure if I could ever get back to me. Like, I felt lost. And I said, but I went out with my friends last week, and I looked in the mirror, and I had a good time that night, and I looked like a little piece of me again. And I saw a glimpse of me, and I was like, there she is. And he, Brian was like, there she is. And I was like, oh my goodness, he's like, we got to write that today. And I was like, yeah, we do. You're the perfect person to do this with, because he's, he's amazing. And, um, and we can be real with each other. Yeah. And so this song is about going through things and then finally seeing this little piece of you and go, oh, there she is. Oh, wait a second. I didn't know I was going to find her again. And then the there she is gets a little bit bigger and then you start becoming you again and you start living again in the way that you know you're meant to, but you didn't know if you could get back up or not. I am so glad that you are continuing to make this music because I am such a fan, Thank as you. are millions of other people around the whole world. Thank you. Um, you are such an inspiration, and I just want to thank you so much for just being such a positive role model. And um, thank you. this has been such an enjoyable conversation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Thanks for having me. You're very welcome.